So today I'll summarize how you can use this little PMS5003 particulate monitor sensor with an Arduino, a data logger, an SD card, and a 6-volt battery pack to help you do some qualitative air quality monitoring in your own backyard. Depending on where you purchase your parts, you can probably build this system as shown here for as little as $40. Of course, you'd want to install this in a field-worthy enclosure for long-term monitoring, which is something I'll talk more about in a future video. Before we get started, I just wanted to take a few seconds to answer the question, what exactly is this sensor measuring? According to the California Air Resources Board, PM is the particulate matter present in the air we breathe that's finer than the width of a human hair. Examples of PM10 and PM2.5 relative to the diameter of a hair are shown on this slide. Both PM10 and PM2.5 can be inhaled through our airways, with PM2.5 presenting a greater risk for traveling and depositing into the deeper parts of the lung, and PM10 being more likely to deposit on the surface of airways and the upper region of the lung. Both PM10 and PM2.5 derive from various emission sources and can be made up of different chemical compositions. Emissions from combustion of fossil fuels and wood produce much of the PM2.5 pollution in the outdoor air we breathe. As you can imagine, air traffic in particular is an important contributor of particulate matter pollution, resulting from the burning of kerosene in jet engines. And this can pose challenges for communities that live close to airports, like those around LAX. The PMS5003 sensor I'll be demonstrating today uses a laser to radiate suspended particles in the air and then measure the resulting scattering light to determine both the number and concentration of particles that make up PM10, PM2.5, and even PM1, which is those particles less than one micrometer in diameter. This is essentially the same technology used in sophisticated air quality monitors approved by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency for monitoring and reporting, but without much of the quality control features required for formal compliance sampling. However, if we're just interested in getting a general idea of air quality or are interested in distributing a network of low-cost sensors for source characterization in an airshed, these could be very useful for citizen scientists or curious residents. A word of caution, if you purchase the sensor on eBay, you will have to cut the wire harness plug from the end and solder on your own wires with male headers to make this breadboard or Arduino friendly. This is what I did for this particular experiment. If you're not comfortable with soldering, you can purchase this sensor from Adafruit, which comes with a breadboard friendly breakout and which includes labels for all the pins in the wire harness. This can save you some confusion and time, as I'll demonstrate shortly. So the wiring for this circuit is fairly simple. You just stack your data logging shield onto your Arduino, connect pins one and two from the sensor to the five volt and ground pin on the data logging shield, connect pin five from the sensor to digital pin two on the data logging shield, and add your battery pack anode and cathode pins to VIN and ground respectively on your data logging shield. According to the sensor documentation, pin one for the anode or VCC is the first pin nearest the center of the box. Your ground will be the second pin from the center and your data transmission pin is associated with the fifth pin. Along those lines, if you reference the color scheme for the wiring diagram shared on Adafruit's website, don't take these colors for granted, which is what I did when I first wired things up. Refer to the actual pin locations in the documentation rather than the color-coded wiring diagram when attaching the sensor to your Arduino. In the case of the unit I purchased on eBay, pin one is purple, pin two is orange, and pin five is green, whereas in Adafruit's wiring diagram, the wires coming off pins one, two, and five are red, black, and blue respectively. That's another example of why, especially when you're first getting started with this stuff, it's sometimes better to uh, purchase from a U.S. vendor that has good documentation for what they're selling and offers good customer support. When you apply some power to your circuit, um, there's a little fan that runs right here, I guess, to help take the sample. And uh, if you put your ear up to this little 
area right over here, you can actually hear that fan whirring if uh, if your power is connected properly. So what I'm going to do is take my mic and I'm going to put it right up next to that area, and then I'll try to boost the uh, the level on the video to see if you can hear it. Oh, I guess I should turn it on. So let's do that. There is a link to the code for this project in the description of this video. I should mention here that this code does require you to be somewhat familiar with data logging shields and their supporting libraries. If you're not familiar with using data loggers, I have a chapter in this playlist which can get you up to speed fairly quickly. If you're new to Arduino and all this isn't clear, I do have an introduction to Arduino playlist associated with this channel that can get you up to speed relatively quickly. Seven twenty. So um, I'm out here in Los Angeles, California, and I'm visiting my mom who literally lives like maybe four blocks away from LAX. When I uh, fly into the airport, I, she lives close enough that I can actually walk to her house, if you can believe that. So um, it's pretty smoggy out here, at least maybe smoggy is not the right word. There's a lot of dust around my mom's house and probably has to do with the fact that these... Um, jet airplanes that are landing every day are, you know, burning kerosene fuel in their jet engines. And there's like this black soot everywhere, which is, uh, which is kind of interesting, I guess. Um, worries me a little bit for my mom's health. But in any event, I thought it would be interesting to bring this little uh, uh, particulate matter meter out to Los Angeles and uh, modify the code a little bit to actually work with a data logger and then set this thing up outside and uh, just see what it registers overnight in terms of uh, in terms of particulate matter and uh, what I did was I modified a sketch that um, I downloaded off of Adafruit's website for this particular meter and uh, I combined it with some other code that I had to write um, water level data to a data logger and basically what I've got is I'm measuring PM 10, PM 2.5 and PM 1 and the data is being written with a timestamp to uh, to my little data logger over here. And I realize the code is reporting these checksum failures. I don't know what that's about, but the uh, but the data between looks valid. Um, so I'm just going to ignore those. I'll sort that data out. I'll leave it as it is for right now and figure it out when I uh, when I get back to Arizona. But I thought I'd just uh, hook this thing up to a little battery pack leave it outside overnight and see what kind of data I get. I think it should be interesting because uh, sometimes if the wind is blowing just right, I can actually smell the rubbers coming off of the, uh, off of the airplane tires when I'm sitting in the backyard, my mom and I are hanging out. Which is, again, a little concerning, but um, such as it is. Okay, just to make sure that things were working okay, I uh, removed the Arduino from the USB power supply so that it wasn't talking to the computer any longer. Uh, and then I hooked the whole thing up to a battery pack. And uh, the records that you see after those blue highlights are the ones that were recorded off the battery pack in my mom's kitchen. So I don't see any of those checksum errors being recorded in the uh, datalog.txt file. And uh, it looks like it will work um, off a of battery pack just fine. So this is my mom's backyard uh, out here in California. And uh, this is usually where I hang out with her. And I'm thinking of moving those plants and just putting the little sensor on that little table right there and uh, just letting it run overnight. You can actually hear the planes right now. I think you can. Um, but these planes will run probably until about midnight before things start to settle down so and as you can tell it's not very windy tonight so um, I shouldn't get too much uh, particulate matter registered we'll see
Okay, so I went ahead and set it up and just put it in a little cake dish. But you can see that the uh, intake for the fan is right there. So this should give me a pretty representative reading of what kind of air quality is in my mom's backyard, being that LAX is just a few blocks in that direction over there. Okay, so it's the next morning and uh, setup is still running off those uh, four double A's, which looks promising. So I'm going to shut it down and take a look at the data, at least uh, see what it recorded overnight. Okay, so I'm actually in my mom's front yard right now. I decided to move this little setup over to the top of my mom's car uh, just because um, I get a lot of weird dust on on my mom's car this this really black sooty stuff and when it rains it kind of stains the car so this is what i'm interested in measuring with this little setup okay so it's been out here all day i'm going to wrap it up take it back to tucson looks like the power's still on so that's good and uh, just to give you a lay of the land and the airport's right on the other side of that wall over there so before I go over the data, let me briefly summarize what the air quality standards are for PM10 and PM2.5 as published on the California Air Resources Board website. A 24-hour average concentration for PM2.5 should not exceed 35 micrograms per meter cubed, and a 24 average for PM10 should not exceed 50 micrograms per meter cubed. These are very low concentrations indeed. In my area, I would expect PM data to increase in response to air traffic coupled with winds from the south and or southwest. As far as what my monitoring data shows, I did have a sustained period of elevated PM10 levels between 12.30 and 2.30 PM, with PM10 peaking at about 105 micrograms per meter cubed. For the 21 hours that were measured, the average was 8.93 micrograms, which, had this been a 24-hour average, would have been below the standard of 50 micrograms per meter cubed for PM10. Similarly for PM2.5, I did have a sustained period of elevated levels between 12.30 and 2.30 PM, with PM2.5 peaking at 95 micrograms per meter cubed. For the 21 hours I measured, the average was 7.60 micrograms, which, had this been a 24-hour average, would have been below the standard set for 35 micrograms per meter cubed for PM2.5. What's interesting about this data is that the majority of my PM10 mass was actually made up of the riskier PM2.5 concentration, although still within acceptable limits, assuming the same dynamics held for the full 24-hour period. During this period, wind direction at LAX was registering from the south-southwest, so if we assume there was no other contributing factor, the data suggests that air traffic was higher during this period. For further experiments, one way to confirm this is to add a decibel meter to our setup in order to approximate air traffic density. Of interest, the area that was being monitored during my brief visit is already designated and paired for PM10 pollution. And not surprisingly, is also designated as impaired for PM2.5 as well. Having grown up in a neighborhood adjacent to LAX, I would have loved to have been able to play with these inexpensive sensors as a kid for maybe a science fair project. Maybe something focused on understanding the impacts of LAX on school air quality, or say, our local public park. The fact that this technology is so easily accessible and affordable opens up some interesting possibilities for citizen scientists and neighborhood associations. Perhaps if you're a resident who lives near LAX or another airport, you might be interested in establishing baseline conditions prior to, say, a planned airport expansion or proposed construction activities. On that note, I've included links where you can purchase all the items you need to build a bare bones air quality sensor and have also posted my code in the description of this video, which you are welcome to use, modify, and improve. If you give this project a spin, please keep me posted in the comments section of this video, and don't hesitate to send me any questions. 
For my part, I look forward to building a solar-powered setup for measuring PM10 2.5 and noise levels at a representative location in Westchester, and then reporting the results to the internet using a cell phone. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please consider subscribing for updates and stay tuned. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.